Hello, dear friends. This is Kardec Radio at 11 p.m. Studying with you another chapter of the book Evolution into Worlds. And we are here to nourish our souls together, right? Welcome, dear friends. Glorious day because we are studying chapter 19th of part 2. We are only one chapter away from completing the whole book. And it's a joy. It's a joy and it's a collective achievement for all of us because this book brings to us the certainty that God loves us, right? There is so much to learn that we got to this day thanks to so many minds, so many loving tutors that guide our lives help us, protect us, etc., etc. In the preface of this book, written in 1958, through the medium Chico Xavier and Valdo Vieira, André Luiz, the spirit author, brings to us 40 chapters telling us, you are loved by God, you are an immortal being, do you feel it? Are you feeling it? Yes? Friends, big hug to all of you. What a joy to see all of you together. And we are together here to study. The chapter is so unique because it talks about health and illnesses. It is titled Morbid Predisposition. But before we begin, let us say a prayer. Let us feel our connection with the loving guides. We're never alone. This book proves to us. Right, friends. A super hug and a heart to all of you. So let us feel our connection with God. Raise our vibrations and express our gratitude. Thank you, God, for allowing us to embrace a new understanding, to embrace this opportunity of feeling ourselves immortal and so loved and cared for. We would like to kindly ask you that the vibrations of this moment are sent to all those in the world who are experiencing the greatest need whether physical emotional or spiritual may they feel a loving embrace may they feel the presence of their guardian angels whom in your name are assigned to guide to protect and to love us unconditionally. Feeling your presence, may you inspire all of us to absorb the lessons that we need to adjust ourselves and continue progressing more steadily than yesterday. And so be it. Joy to the world. Here comes André Luiz. Let's see what he says, shall we? Morbid predisposition. So let us go. We're going to begin with the very, very, very first, the title. Chapter 19, part 2. It's about morbid predisposition. You may be asking, what is morbid predisposition? So before anything else, we'll bring the definition of it. So we're on the same page. Welcome, friends. So it says here, morbid predisposition is, what is it? By definition, is when somebody is susceptible to disease. Okay, so they are predisposed to a morbid condition. 
It's like when we talk about, oh, the person is pre-diabetic. Well, they are not diabetic yet, but they are in the direction of becoming. So they are predisposed physiologically, okay? So Andrea Luis is going to talk about our predisposition to illnesses, to diseases. So then he asks, that's the first question that Andrea Luis asks in this chapter. How can we understand the existence of morbid predispositions in the spiritual body? Hmm? He's asking, what does spiritism tell us? You're going to be surprised that Andre Lewis begins by telling. Well, we can't forget, he says, that carelessness or imprudence, carelessness or imprudence, laziness, cause a diversity of diseases. If we didn't know it, we need to know. We know that living a sedentary life leads us to diseases. We know that lack of moderation leads us to diseases, right? And he outlines, gives us examples. Gluttony causes circulatory disasters. Eating more than the body can eat. And that varies from person to person. Of course, there is an average, but it varies from person to person. Some people tell me, but Vanessa, Michael Phelps eats, I don't know how many hamburgers, how many hot dogs, how many pizzas. Well, but he's a, an Olympian athlete. He needs more calories then us, we don't swim eight hours a day, right? As far as I know, we may swim in the waters of life, but not in the real waters as a swimmer. So he needs that much calorie. I don't know, but in our case, we can't. So we need to be attentive to embrace moderation. By the way, when we talk about moderation, the beauty of it all, it's inevitable to recall Ben Franklin. Benjamin Franklin, one of the founding fathers of the United States of America, and also one of the spirits that helped the codification of spiritism, go to the initial part of the Spirits book by Kardec, entitled Prolegomena. Several spirits signed the preface of the book, that introduction, one of them, Ben Franklin. I know some people are surprised when we say it, but of course, he was a genius, and a genius in life, when he discarnated, he certainly surrendered to the governance of the planet, consciously speaking, and he's helping us redirect it. Ben Franklin, when he was incarnated in that very reincarnation as Ben Franklin, he wrote a 13 virtual program that he assigned to himself as a proposal to boost his virtues, one of them being moderation. He says, of the need of moderation. He was only 20 years of age. So here we have Andre Lewis beginning the paragraph talking about the need of habits that are moderated. Let's go back and see what else he refers to. He talks about lack of hygiene that causes infections. Remember, this book was written in 1958 but this is still up to date. There are levels and levels of hygiene. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, we know we need to wash our hands before eating a meal, but there are people who still believe that taking a shower every so often is enough. 
please research on this and don't believe the silly types of articles that are released saying that you're healthier not taking shower daily. Mm -hmm. Spiritually and physically, it's positive to take a shower every day. Okay, bottom line. Okay, just to cut it short. Right, Gabriel, Inácio, welcome, welcome. And here we have drug addiction causes nervous imbalances. I know people who still doubt that smoking pot and snorting cocaine can do any harm. I know people who actually ask, but is it a problem? Of course it is. And there is enough science proving to us that you are predisposing yourselves to mental illnesses because it changes our neurochemistry. Congratulations, Gabriel Inácio. You made it. Valeria as well. Karina Liz and many others who are in a different time zone and are here with us. Thank you for bringing this togetherness, friends. And Andrea Luis tells us, various excessive activities may cause exhaustion. Pause for a second. I know you want more. But this book is not about knowledge. It's about feeling. The scripture. He's talking about moderation and laziness. There is one question we need to ask. Okay, we'd like to ask as per our own self-awareness. Scale 0 to 10. Where do you think you are in terms of your body awareness? Where do you think you are in terms of your body awareness? Do you listen to your body? To its needs and limits? Or do you go over what it can put up with? Usually, we don't know the limit. Usually, we don't listen to the body. And that's why we may overwork the physical body. So, even excessive activity that leads us to exhaustion. And I'll say this. If you have to go to a spirit center, right? Usually you go and we quickly want to go home, right? But when it comes to a party, usually we don't look at the watch to see when we have to go home. Isn't that funny? Hmm? And that's what Andrea Luis is also talking about. When it comes to certain types of activities, they really drain ourselves. Drain, but to the point that we feel vampirized and we don't watch out. So we need to listen. Why? What is your most important asset when you reincarnate? The physical body. What is the first and the last? Anything else goes away. But the physical body stays with us from day one to the last day of our incarnation. How good are we at taking care of this physical body? The physical body is not you. The physical body is with you. Again, the physical body is not us. This physical body is with us. Are we listening to it? You feel guilty when you need to rest? Don't, because your physical body needs help. And it doesn't mean you're going to rest for days and hours to no end, but creating a wise method to rest both the mind and the body. That's a difference, right? Right, thank you, Gabriel. I just saw your sentence here. That's why I'm referring to it now. So, Andre Luis begins this chapter referring to how we march towards diseases without noticing through our eating habits through our hygiene habits, habits, and through our excessive activities. Abuses, that's what we call drug abuse, because it's abuse, right? 
So let us go back to Andre Luis and see what else he adds. He then says to us the following that the deep root of illnesses, like a general rule, lies in the spiritual body. The etiology of long standing illnesses is in the perispirit. Is in the perispirit. It's in the spiritual body. And I know people who doubt and say, but this is just a headache. Well, but you think it just came up like this. Nothing happens to the physical body without being guided consciously or unconsciously by the mind. Psychosomatics tell us spiritism brings to us the reinforcement of it. Everything is in the spiritual body, the perispirit. Do you remember the definition according to spiritism? Perispirit is a word that is technically created by Allan Kardec. Peri meaning around the spirit. So around the spirit. We learn with spiritism that the spirit is created and then through the universal cosmic fluid, we attract molecules that clothe ourselves according to our needs. And in this book, Evolution into Worlds, we've been learning how we form our peri spirit and how the peri spirit evolves, taking different shapes and forms and sizes. To the point that we go through internships in the different kingdoms of nature till the current one, the human one. So now we have a spiritual body that is in the form of human body. Mm -hmm. That's why the physical looks like a human body because the perispiritual body takes that form. But it's something that was acquired in billions of years. Right? Now, no health or illnesses will pop up without going first through the mind imprinting the spiritual body. From the spiritual body, it may imprint itself in the physical. Then Andrea Lewis explains something quite unique now. Be prepared because this is one of the main parts of this chapter. He says, If we want to understand the dynamics of the formation of illnesses, he says that everything begins when we make a grave mistake. And the memory and the remembrance, the recollection of that grave mistake, he says, is going to create in us, if we don't watch out, he says, I have the very text here with me, I put bullet points here, but he says, if we don't deal with the feelings that are generated by recollecting our mistake, what's going to happen? He says, we're going to form a zone of remorse, he says, in our spiritual body, the perispirit, okay, that will create what he says, a nodule of disturbance that is going to vibrate. predisposing us to illnesses. It's like a magnet. My mind emits mental electromagnetic force. And if I keep in that memory, he says, that single idea, oh my gosh, I did that mistake. Oh my gosh, I did that mistake. The remorse, right? Oh my gosh, I did that mistake. And recollecting recollecting, recollecting, like suicidal spirits. It goes again 
and again and again what happens to the spiritual body it creates like a a zone of remorse that is like a vibrating nodule of disturbance like a knot like a cyst like a, a polyp like a tumor in the spiritual body and what happens next you may be asking what happens next he says that single idea onto this nodule of disturbing forces okay is going to magnetically attract situations in which we're going to have to expunge it to rebalance ourselves so now we know how when we talk about balance where it comes from we're talking about the balance from the mind to the spiritual body to the physical some people they go after healing healing mediums healing sessions thinking they're going to heal the body but it doesn't happen that way it begins in the mind to the spiritual body to the physical it's not from the outside in it's from the inside out so in this case we're seeing that inevitably he says these crystallizations of profound energies in the inside of ourselves is what we call karmic debts they express our karmic debts okay and then we are going to obviously need to reincarnate to expunge it out of our very spirit that's why there is a part of this chapter in which he explains to us something quite unique he says this happens if i don't know let me go back here how to manage that remorse so he says without venting unburden and correction as means of decompression towards repentance the mind creates a zone of remorse so he says if you're feeling remorse any form of guilt work on it do not put it under the carpet because it's going to become bigger and attract bad things what if you put any trash under anything bugs are going to come rodents etc right energetically when we do not deal with remorse and guilt it stays there vibrating ta 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 ta, -ta. and it's going to do what he says remorse triggers a diversity of um he says imbalances in our inner selves creating an imbalance of the spiritual body predisposing us to illnesses remorse what is the homework you already know right question what is my main remorse because usually we carry several in this life it doesn't need to be in previous lives in this life face it and says i need to work on this how he says putting it out and correcting ah but nobody knows but you know god knows and by the fact that you know and god knows it's enough to remedy it we can't any longer cannot hide it gabriel inácio is saying that's why it's important to forgive ourselves and go on. exactly forgive forget and correct ourselves says andrea luis let's observe the slide in which he says 
we need to correct ourselves. Car Andre Lewis says correct. Kardec says in the book Heaven and Hell, reparation. Oh, but I did this. Do you forgive yourself when you did things in your youthful years? I didn't know any better, but you still have it in the back of your mind. Right? Still have in the back of the mind. So Andrea Louis is saying, do not let it sit there because it's going to create that nodule of disturbance. And it's going to attract situations to expunge it out through XPA and also illnesses. Why? So go after that correction sooner than later, that reparation. Don't wait for another life, this life. Let me ask you this. If you are saying, oh, but you know, I made a mistake with my child. Now he or she is a grown up. What can I do? Well, you can help the child of others. That's a way to repair. By helping with others, you can help your own conscience. Okay? Fernando Oliveira is saying, love to study the Paris Spirit in this book a lot. Thank you, Fernando, for sharing. Our dear friend, Galea Severo, is kindly helping us as well by saying, Book Thought and Life by Emmanuel, Chapter 22. It's all about guilt. Thank you, Leia. <clears throat> so he is saying to us that and that's why psychotherapy is so important. Some people say, I don't want to go because I'm not crazy. Well, but you will become crazy because that remorse imbalances us. So go find help. There are so many different types. If you haven't found yours, keep researching. You need to find a good helping hand to coach you to the next level. We don't know it. Ideally, we should study about emotions in schools. We should learn about how to manage it in schools. We don't have that yet. Little by little, schools absorbing the ABCs of it, but it's still baby steps. Well, it's better than before, but we're a long way from actually getting to the real deal. Meanwhile, we have psychologists, social workers, therapists in general, that can give us a hand on dealing with that remorse and repairing it. So he says the importance of putting it out, elaborating the feelings, what psychology and psychoanalysis says, catharsis, too much emotion, I deal with it with the help of somebody as well, and then I start my reparation. Hmm? Right? The good deed covers a bunch of misdeeds. Love it, Gabriel Inácio. We did a duet here. You begun and I ended it. The good deed covers a bunch of misdeeds. <laughs> right? So, not to use the word sin. But thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're so right. So he says, even if we are forgiven by our victims, we still detain, we still keep inside of our mind the guilt, and we need to expunge it by doing our moral hygiene. Andre Lewis says, moral hygiene. So that's what we're going to do in the next 24 hours. Cleansing, moral hygiene. Okay, let us work on our moral hygiene, shall we, friends? Huh? That's why Andre Lewis, in the book The Messengers, Liberation, and others, he talks about mental bacteria. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow, in the last chapter, we're going to learn about bacteria 
mental bacteria, etc., etc. Today, we're learning how we predispose ourselves to illnesses. So quickly, quiz, quickly. What does predispose us to illnesses? A big mistake that we recollect generates remorse, guilt, and that leads us to creating a zone of remorse in the spiritual body that vibrates the imbalance as a nodule of disturbance attracting the need for its expulsion from our spiritual body. Rudy saying inner silence helps to discover those hidden remorses. Thank you for sharing this. Some people are afraid of this silence, right, Rudy? And that's why we say, if you cannot deal with it by yourself, find help. Okay? Right? Exactly. Thank you, Gabriel Inácio. You're doing great. You're doing great. You said it correctly. I just added for uh, philosophical reasons, but the language is super right. Okay? That's the question number one that Andra Lewis asked in this chapter. Deal with guilt and remorse sooner than later. Or we're going to bring that predisposition to illnesses also to other lives. Second question that he asks to us today. He asks, how can the mentally and I'm keeping the wording here, okay? We could go over the linguistics here, but he's talking about a mentally impaired person. Command the cellular renovation of the physical body. So he wants to make us think about the dynamics of the mental command. So there is the conscious and the unconscious, and he's going to talk about it in different words. He says, though disturbed, the conscience is present in the mentally challenged people as well as in the mentally ill people of all nature. Rewind the tape. In previous stages of our evolution, we didn't have consciousness, and yet the spiritual principle that animated the amoeba, the virus, the plants, the flowers, the animals in general, they commanded the renovation of the physical body. These are automated functions that do not require consciousness. Mm -hmm. So, that's the explanation. It seems complicated, but it's very straightforward. Right? Then he asks a more complex question. That may be new to some of us. Huh? Okay, let me go back here. Since our dear friend... Carol Correa asks an important question here. Thank you, Carol. She's saying, how may we engage in moral hygiene? By seeking the good and doing the good? Of course, Carol. That's a beautiful way of addressing it, Carol. I think it is. There, there's possibly many ways, but that one certainly summarizes it all. Moral hygiene, seeking the good, always. In people, situations, always as an opportunity to grow, to progress. Right? I'll give you an example. Okay? Real. The other day, I was practicing the piano. And Virginia was also practicing, but she came along. It was my turn. She came along and started being funny, playing a few keys that had nothing to do with the piano song. 
And at first I was like, oh man, you're not letting me practice. But then I recalled that our teacher said, good way to practice is to have somebody play some other thing and we keep focus on ours. Hmm? You see? So, if I seek the good, I keep it up. If I don't seek the good, I'll be unnecessarily upset about something that there is no need to be upset. There is always a good twist to anything. Seeking that good requires effort, requires repetition, and the openness of creativity. Right? Thank you, Carol. Thank you for asking the question and delivering the answer. Right? Back to Andre Luis again. So he says to us, okay, back to Andre Luis. He asks, are there parasitic ovoids vampirizing discarnate spirits? Pause. I'm not so sure if everybody knows because it depends if you were here with us when we were studying chapter on um, parasitism, symbiosis, parasitism, when Andre Luis described how ovoids happen. So we're talking about spirits that really encapsulated themselves in hatred, revenge, pretty much losing the human shape, becoming like an ovoid, like an egg. They didn't become as spirits, but the spiritual body. Why? Because they have that single idea. Can they, these spirits that turn their shape into an ovoid, vampirize the discarnate spirits? What's the answer? Yes. There are. Every time there is a vindicative obsession happening in the lower regions of the earth. So, when you go to the book No Solar, you see a woman knocking on the door, the gates of No Solar, to find help. Andre Luis wants her to go in. But the mentor says, hey, open your eyes. Look around her. And he's like, what? And he sees these ovoids and he gets the explanation of what they are. In a previous life, many abortions related to her. And thus, the spirits were still vindicative, still angry, seeking a vengeance, vengeance, and vampirizing her. She's discarnated, they are discarnated, they are sucking the energy. Mm -hmm. Rewind the tape of that chapter we've studied before, and you get a hold of the whole explanation on how this is possible, okay? But Andrea Lewis continues, by explaining to us. They are very common scenarios that move us to tears due to the ignorance and passion present therein. So, these are very common scenarios. These are obsessions. Mm -hmm. Chapter 23, and I'll write it down. Chapter 23 of the Medium's book by Kardec. You need to read because in that chapter we get the information on obsessions. Mm -hmm. Very common. Very common. 
in the spiritual realm, in the physical realm. What is the definition of obsession? In that chapter, it says, Obsession is a persistent, negative influence of some spirit over another. It could be incarnate to incarnate, incarnate to discarnate. Yes, I may be obsessing somebody who is discarnated. How? I don't let go. They discarnated and we're still talking about, angry about. We're obsessing because it's a persistent negative influence. Meaning, thoughts and feelings. Incarnate to incarnate. I look at somebody or think of somebody who's incarnated and I only have bad thoughts. I am an obsessor. Day and night, oh, I wake up with that person in mind, sleep with that person in mind, wake up with that person in mind, sleep with that person in mind, wake up with that person in mind, sleep with that person in mind, and it's only bad things. Obsession. Quickly get out of it. How? Substituting thoughts and feelings. Thought of the person saying, I believe you admit, I believe in you as a child of God. Instead of going on and on what they've done, I believe in you as a child of God. You are a child of God. Sing to them mentally. You are a child of God. Visualize Jesus. Envelop them in light and love. So substituting thoughts and feelings to the day we will no longer feel that way about them. So I think about something positive that they do. They are good professionals. They are responsible. They are serious. I am a need. Gratitude for they are doing their part. Though we have our difference. But one day, it's a sure thing. We will become friends. And there are discarnates. Classically. Huh? That obsess discar incarnates, but also discarnates that obsess discarnates. And that's the case, one of the cases, right? Simple, straightforward. Next, next, next question. Can we? Yeah, next. Andrea Louise asks How can we understand the mechanisms of superior justice in cases of rural endemic diseases? We can't forget that Chico Xavier, in this book, he was still living in Pedro Leopoldo while Valdo Vieira was in Uberaba. At that time, it was very common. Sometimes people ask, how did these questions come about? Well, they are peculiar to a certain moment, but they are universal in a way, of course. So the answer here may be extrapolated to, for example, winter time when somebody gets a flu and it's like the flu season, people say. Are you doomed to the flu? Am I doomed to the flu just because somebody else has the flu? No. But there is a collective experience, right? And that's what Andrea Luis is going to explain. In epidemiology, Epidemiology, an infection is said to be endemic in a population when that infection is maintained in the population without the need for external inputs, right? Besides, the individual, and this is not DE, it's the E. Right? I'm going to make the correction here. Sorry, friends. Let me make the correction here. Sorry for stopping. Okay. Besides the individual karmic features 
there is the need of progress, the individual's karmic, karmic features. There is the need of progress in regard to greater hygiene of the population. So now, of course, Andre Lewis is telling us about things that are of the essence. Two times in the same chapter that he refers to hygiene. Physical, moral. Physical and moral. Actually, three times he talks about hygiene of the body and illnesses. And then he talks about moral hygiene. And now he repeats again. It's not by chance that he's talking about predispositions to illnesses and hygiene, moral and physical. So let us really focus on this, how we can improve. And I'm going to mention something about our homes, okay? Because we are living at a time in which people do not, because of their busy lives at work, they are like, ah, taking care of the house is secondary. Uh, not quite. It's vital to make sure that our homes are cleaned well. Mm -hmm. It's important. Read the book, Volte. I forgot how we titled the series. It's about uh, Brother Jacob. Through Chico Xavier, that book, we did the whole series at Kardec Radio last year. I guess it was last year. It's been two years that we're doing these studies together. But I think it was last year when we studied the book Volte. And in that book, Brother Jacob shows to us how Dr. Bezerra de Menezes teaches him how we have a fluidic connection with each and every object in the physical plane. So people who are hoarders have a serious mental, physical problem. People who don't know how to dispose of things accumulate and don't know how to clean. We need to improve it. Physically, morally, okay? To be neat is a quality. It is a virtue. To be neat in our things. Organized. Divaldo Frank, I'll give you an example. So organized. I remember visiting him at the Mission of the Way. The many times he spent with us in our homes. And even his luggage, everything so orderly. And he has his own discipline method. He travels, comes, if he's in a hotel or if he's in a, in a, a, at the house of somebody who is hosting him. He goes to his bedroom, takes the clothes he's going to use that day or those days separate it, but everything else is so orderly there. And then prepares his things on his desk. What do you do when you usually travel? Mess. Many people. It's like, ah, it's not my house. The luggage is on this side. The clothes that are dirty on that side. Clothes that are good, clean on the other side. Shoes everywhere in the hotel room. And then people come back sick, not feeling well after a vacation. Well, no discipline, no order, no hygiene in the physical or in the moral. What's the consequence? Diseases. I won't say anything anymore, okay? Right, Daisy? So interesting. Daisy is an expert in public health. So it's very interesting how he talks about these issues here. 
Now, talking about morbid predispositions, illnesses, Andre Luiz asks a question, where is the perispirit of people in coma? It's funny when he asks these questions, and I tell you why. Because he has somewhat already addressed these questions in books that he wrote before, right? In the book, In the Greater World, there's a beautiful case in action and reaction, cases of spirits in coma. And he shows to us that they're pretty awake, right? But he is just opening to us, teasing us to study deeply the mechanisms. He's saying to us, I want to know, we want to know more about the dynamics. If the spirit is, the perispirit is enveloped in spirit, connected to the physical body. The physical body is in a coma. What happens to this perispirit? Is he there somewhere else? And he's going to answer, it depends on the mental condition of the young person. And that's why when you talk to people who had near-death experiences, you're going to see a variety of experiences. Some went all the way up to clinics in the spiritual realm or to schools in the spiritual realm. Or they say they stay there and they observe everything that everybody was doing. That's just a teaser because he doesn't say more than that in this um, part of the book. Are you ready for the next? And the last part of this chapter, so interesting, is going to unfold something that I think Joyce Maganian is going to love and the people who work in healthcare are going to love because it talks about treatment. The beauty of this chapter, the promise consoler. What are the main methods used by spirituality in the treatment of the perispiritual lesions? Okay, so let's go back. Our dear Rudy helped us here. Book Volte, 21 to Spiritual Awakening. Thank you, Rudy. What a beautiful book, huh? So if you go to Kardec Radio's YouTube, youtube.com slash Kardec Radio or to the Facebook playlists of Kardec Radio. You go there, playlist, 21 Days to Spiritual Awakening. You can go through the whole book and get to know that passage when Dr. Bezerra de Menezes talks about our fluidic connections between us and the physical objects that we have at home. So declutter and give it to somebody who needs more than you. Don't keep it there. Just pass it on. And clean. It doesn't need to be obsessive, but nice, neat, and clean. Uncomplicating our lives, energetically speaking. So let's go to the next and last question of this chapter that is really a treat for us. He says, what are the main methods used to treat perispiritual lesions? Question for us. What are perispiritual lesions? Hmm? What are perispiritual lesions? What are they? The nodules of disturbance that we created. Right? Those zones of remorse. We only hurt ourselves when we hurt our conscience. Mm -hmm. So then we have imbalances, those knots of imbalanced vibrations. How do we heal it? We want to know, right? Yes, we want to know it. And before we move on, our dear Fernando Oliveira is reminding us. Thank you, Fernando. Chapter 14 of the book Genesis about fluids, in which it talks about the spiritual fluids that we create in our own homes with our thoughts, feelings, words, and actions. Beautiful. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Fernando. That's the beauty of a group work, right? So, our perispiritual lesions, how we're going to deal with it? 
Andrea Lewis explains to us. First of all, the doctors of the beyond, they go through the history of the patient to understand the mechanism of the illness. Two, they examine the psychosomatic tissues, meaning the perispiritual tissues, with advanced instrumentation and technology. They have superior technology than we do here in the physical plane. And the spirit doctors evaluate the possibility of reversibility or irreversibility of the disease before a new reincarnation. So they research on it. They evaluate it. And then he says, numerable illnesses, he says here. Okay, let me go back one step here. Because Andre Luis reinforces, he says, before another reincarnation, and does the reason why many ill people or sick people are treatable, but only, only healed through long or short internships in the physical body. So, we can expunge from the mind those imbalances that we have created. Okay? Reincarnation is a blessing. The more we read this, we cherish our reincarnation. And there are people whom I know, they are counting the days to die. And I say, why do you want to die, my friend? Because you don't know when you're going to have the same resources you have nowadays. It could be worse. Seek the good in the one you're living. Don't count the days to die. Don't talk about this. Live in the pleasant. Bloom where you were planted. Right now. Seeking the pleasantness in the present. It's an effort that we need to make. And then he says, memorable illnesses are curable, right? After a short or long period of internship in matter, when the person will heal herself by being in direct touch with the struggles that she needs to master and overcome. So instead of complaining, nagging, say, thank God. Thank you, God, for today. Thank you, God, I'm here again. Thank you, God, for everything. Thank you, God, for my life. Yes. And he says that the doctors of the beyond are going to use medication too. Because every medication is a projection of chemo, meaning chemical, electrical elements over the cells, stimulating its functions or correcting them. So as much as we use remedies in the physical, they use remedies in the spiritual. That's why I know an adorable spirit. So that says, oh, I go to the spiritual realm and I help Professor Rivitz Barsanufu in his pharmacy making remedies for people <laughs> and I don't doubt yes you think pharmacies only ex exist here in the physical no everything that exists here is a reflex of a reflection of what happens in the spiritual rough reflection hello Raza how are you she's asking can people become more diseased than cured in certain reincarnation Yes. Last chapter, I think yesterday, we talked a little bit about it. When we aggravate our debts, it may, according to our decisions in life. 
I think the chapter we've studied yesterday touch touches this point more clearly. Okay, thank you for asking. All right. So the remedies exist there and here. What does that mean? Oh, there is no remedy for my illness yet on earth. But in the spiritual, they already have it. Really? Really? Yes. Oh, you don't find a solution here, but they already have in the spiritual. And they can help you at the source, the pure spirit. The mind, the pure spirit. That's why in the spirit book by Allan Kardec, when he talks about the intervention of the spirits, which is chapter 9, part 1, right? Chapter 9 of the spirit book, part 2, actually. It says, uh, the intervention, guardian angels, protecting spirits, and St. Augustine has a whole thesis saying, when higher spirits ask to incarnate or reincarnate for a mission, they come at peace knowing that they can meet, refresh themselves when they are at rest, napping, sleeping. So he says, when you go to sleep, go. Talk to the spirits who are protecting you. Receive instructions. And Andre Luis, in the second chapter of Revolution into Worlds, complements. And you may even go through a spiritual surgery during the night when you're sleeping because they can externalize the vital centers, the chakras, and operate on them using remedies and instruments that we don't have on the earth yet, physically speaking. So if you do not have a medication to heal you in the physical realm, why not going to sleep and say, can I please stop by at the pharmacy in the spiritual realm to take the medication that they already have there while I don't have it here in the physical? Why not? Why not? Because it exists. Start treating ourselves at the source and then reincarnating. Okay? Raz is asking what happens to those who have difficulties sleeping. Find a way. Find help. Professional help. Go to a homeopathic doctor. Mm -hmm. Find help. Okay? There is good homeopathy that can help you put to sleep more easily and there is no harm in terms of dependency and if the sleep is disturbed we need to do moral hygiene okay read the book obsession and if you don't find the book go to kardec radio's podcasts carol correa kindly led this session which is the recording of the book obsession by manuel flandimeno de Miranda through divaldo franco all the chapters are there. You can listen to the podcast and there is the explanation of what we can do. Because if we're being obsessed, we need to go through a serious treatment. And who is not, Raza? It's hard to find somebody on the earth who is not undergoing this form of challenge, okay? But we would say cleansing the heart and letting go of resentment, dealing with remorse. And then, shaping ourselves up, do the good. Only when we leave our problems aside and go help others is when we can go to sleep more easily. Okay? Ah, okay, the link. Thank you. So... Let me just write it down here. Hopefully, somebody's going to write it down for you. The link, maybe Carol Correa, Lea Severo, the podcast of the book Obsession by Manuel 
Filomeno de Miranda, do Divaldo Franco, at Podcasts Radio. Okay? So let us keep that in mind as a good reference. Thank you for asking. Okay, book obsession. One more, shall we, friends? There is a beautiful information here. You won't believe it. Beautiful, beautiful. He says even more. He says that the spirits that treat us in the beyond, they have great character and purity of the heart. Exactly. So, if you do not like physicians in the physical, in the spiritual, they are the real deal. Not that they don't exist in the, on the earth, because we know quite a few physicians and psychotherapists who are really diligent and good, loving-hearted. But in this case, when you think of the, the healthcare providers in the beyond, loving, caring, diligent. It can't go wrong. Okay? One more information. <clears throat> they offer academic culture and also moral qualities with value, humility, devotion, diligence. So, if you're going to sleep, say a prayer. Trust in the goodness of God and say, please, spirit doctors, take me to the clinic so I can heal myself, balance myself out. I trust in you, in your divine wisdom. Surrender yourself, knowing that they have clinics that are super advanced. They have medications and treatments that are the vanguard of humanity on earth that one day will be materialized by the science in the physical plane. Is that it? Yes, this is it for today. This is the chapter on morbid predispositions. So from learning about dealing with remorse and guilt to actually seeking help. Don't humble yourself. Let us humble ourselves and say, I need help. Go find help. But be a good patient. Follow through the prescriptions with humility. And in the next 24 hours, we're going to be asked to do moral hygiene. Physical hygiene, but mostly moral hygiene. Seeking the good, as Carol said. Seeking the good and telling yourself, I believe in me. Do you believe in you? I believe in me as a divine being. I believe in me and I believe in your divine. I believe that the good is all there is. Nothing else. So, friends, I thank you so much. Tomorrow, the last chapter, Macrobian Invasion. And the end of this book is supreme. Come back tomorrow for more with Andrea Lewis. In the book Evolution into Worlds, we're happier today than... Almost two months ago when we started it. Because now we are more certain. And we are loved, protected, and cared for. Thank you, Rudy. Thank you, friends. And let's say this. Thank you, Gabriel, Felipe, friends. Let us raise our thoughts. And pray. Dear spirit mentors of this study. We thank you for your love and your kindness. And we pray that we are easy in the hands 
of those who are guiding us and treating us. May we go through the treatment that we need. May we be diligent in doing the good, practicing greater selflessness and greater humility. And we can already visualize ourselves in the future, already freer from such impediments. Being together with all of you side by side, helping many others. We thank you for your patience, for your loving care. And may we be with you today and always. May all those who are experiencing cruel afflictions receive a hug of kindness, a blanket of consolation, and the whisper of hope, igniting also in them the fire of hope, knowing that life is precious and it's worthwhile staying calm and surrendered to your loving kindness and God's designs. With your permission, we close this moment of true therapy for our souls. And so be it. Thank you, Rihanna. Thank you, Daisy. Thank you, Raza. Thank you, Sunshine. Carol, Barbara, and many friends. Rudy, tomorrow, the last chapter. Don't miss it. Big hug to you, friends.